Welcome to Boswell Book Company's virtual event series. It is day 4,681 of us being in business, and we are thrilled to bring you a delightful event uh, that was once in person, but is now virtual, uh, partly due to Omicron, but partly uh, because it's like minus 300 degrees outside. So I'm Daniel from Boswell. I just want to let you know this is the debut of Juno Black's first novel in the Shady Hollow series. Um, some of you may be experiencing deja vu because you're thinking, wait, I feel like I know about this book already. And in fact, maybe I went to this event, but it is true uh, because this book was uh, originally through a small publisher and is now being published by Vintage Black Wizard. Um, this book has been receiving wonderful reviews and raves. Um, it is a February Indie Next pick. Um, Alan Bradley, the wonderful mystery writer, calls Shady Hollow, Watership Down meets Mickey Spillane, a mystery of rare and sinister charm. And Wisconsin's Amy Reichert, author of such novels as The Kindred Spirit Supper Club, says, get ready to fall in love with Shady Hollow and its quirky cast of animal characters. Charming and clever, Juno Black will take readers on a delightful ride as the mystery unfolds. I can't wait to read more. If you're coming to this blindly, you're thinking, wait a minute, this book is written by one person, but there are two people here. And that is, in fact, another mystery that has been revealed. Juno Black consists of the publishing writing duo of Sharon Nagel and Jocelyn Cole. Um, I should note that Jocelyn Cole also writes romances under the name Elizabeth Cole. I believe speculative work under Jocelyn Cole. And Sharon Nagel is also a Whitefish Bay librarian under the name Sharon Nagel. We are... Um, <laughs> So honored and delighted that tonight's event is in conversation with Margaret Petrie, creativity podcaster, who is also one of the original champions of Shady Hollow. What a crowd of stars we have assembled tonight. Thank you both so much for coming. I am going to go back to my other duty of monitoring the chat and, and questions. So thank you both. Let's give them a big hand virtually. You can see my hands. You know, so. <laughs> thank you, Daniel. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me and letting me do this. Um, Daniel missed one of my favorite reviews, which is from Eagle Harbor Books in Bainbridge Island. And it says, think Wes Anderson meets Clue meets Frog and Toad. Yes, yes, yes. Absolutely. All of that. So we're going to get to our conversation in a minute, but first of all, I'm going to have Jocelyn just read the first small chapter of Shady Hollow, and then we'll move on to conversation. Thank you. Um, I am going to be reading from the British edition, which is why it has this bright yellow cover that looks different from the one that you have probably seen. Um, through a quirk, I got the British books before I got the American books, so... Um, I am just going to read the first chapter, set the mood, and then we will start chatting. So, One lovely dawn in late August, the sun was cresting the tops of the distant hills to pour its golden light over the forest. Gladys Honeysuckle, always an early riser, was already on the wing, more than halfway into her daily journey toward town. She was a hummingbird, as her name implied, and her bright green wings were always in motion, going a hundred miles an hour. Her tongue seemed no different. Gladys had something of a reputation as the town gossip. Conveniently, she was well employed by the Shady Hollow Herald, the town's sole newspaper, where she wrote a regular column about town events and goings on. Not a prestigious post, perhaps, but one suited to her gifts. B.W. Stone, the editor of the Herald, had kindly provided Gladys with a small desk in the newsroom, making her the first gossip columnist to rate as a regular reporter. This distinction made Gladys puff up her chest with pride and ensured her daily attendance at the paper. B.W. Stone liked all his reporters to be on site where he could keep his sharp skunk eyes on them. Gladys was a widow and her chicks were gone and grown and gone. A true empty nester, she looked forward to going to work every day. 
Further, she was determined to prove her worth to the paper, thus assuring that her job would exist forever. On this particular morning, she left her small straw nest cottage located high in a beech tree outside town and flew toward the center of the village and the newspaper office. Peering down the quiet paths partly hidden beneath the leaves, she saw that almost no one was about yet. She spied only Joe ambling along the north track, his massive hooves surprisingly quiet on the road. The moose was not by nature an early riser, at least not compared to the bird folk, but Joe wouldn't dream of allowing a customer to wait outside his coffee shop. He was up well before dawn to open the cafe with fresh Joe ready to serve. He seemed to be at work at all hours with nary a complaint, despite being alone in the world, but for his son, Joe Jr. Servers and cooks came and went. Joe was a constant. Gladys paid Joe little mind while she winged her way over the forest. She had her own wish issues to worry about, thank you very much. While she darted over the tallest branches, her buzzing brain was fully occupied with thoughts of her youngest, Heather, who had recently moved in with a, her new husband. They were both grown, true, but it is a mother's prerogative to worry about her offspring, and Gladys was no exception. Of course, her chick claimed to be happy. They lived off in their own world a day's flight away, but who really knew? not Gladys, who was uncharacteristically feeling quite left out of the loop and rather anxious as a result. This was a state she never wanted to be in. She trembled at the very notion of unheard gossip. Lost in thought, Gladys circled twice over the mill pond, gaining height on an updraft. She glanced down at the water yet to be touched by sunlight. Coasting on the wind, she spied something out of the ordinary, a shape that didn't quite fit. She swooped back for another look. What could it be, a sack of some type? A bit of lost wood floating in the pond? She dipped even lower, her natural curiosity bubbling forth. The object broke the smooth surface of the water, shapeless and perplexing in the pale dawn light. It was still and quiet, but it was no clump of weeds or loose log that had drifted to the middle of the pond at the behest of the gentle current. The hummingbird's heart went cold. This shape was getting awfully familiar. Her wings beating furiously, Gladys flew even lower, hovering directly above the body of a toad, belly up, and not just any toad, Otto Sumpf. Otto was a longtime resident of Shady Hollow. He had a reputation for being grumpy and surly, though some residents insisted that underneath the facade, he was quite kind. He would never thank you to point it out though. Now, it appeared, he was also quite dead. His pale legs were stiff, if not for the position of the body and its terrible stillness, he might have been in mid-leap. Stunned, Gladys registered these incidental facts were staring at the poor toad from a vantage point only birds enjoy. From the shore, Gladys's actions would be unclear should anyone be watching. She didn't consider that, however, because the horrible truth of Otto's demise was still coalescing in her frantic mind. Dead, poor Otto was dead, and she, Gladys Honeysuckle, was the first to know. At last, Gladys glanced nervously around to see if anyone else was present. She had discovered a body and she had to tell someone. Her tiny hummingbird heart thrummed with palpitations so rapid she thought she might faint. She had vital news of interest to the whole of Shady Hollow. She had to tell someone. No, she had to tell everyone. A small voice in her head reminded her that the police should be informed first and foremost. That's right, she nodded importantly to herself. The authorities had to be notified. She would call the police after she got to her office and calmed down a little. Though she was not terribly fond of Otto, he was, had been, a neighbor, and it was most off-putting to find one's neighbor dead on the way to work. Somehow, the shocked and sickened Gladys finished her flight landing at the newspaper office. She hurried inside, hoping no one else had made it in just yet. But as soon as she entered the front door of the building, Gladys smelled the harsh notes of newsroom coffee. She knew exactly who it had to be, the fox. I don't know what happens next. No, I've read the book <laughs> a few times, so I guess I do know what happens next. Thank you so much for that. And introducing us to all those characters as you were reading um, a question I do not have written down. How did you come up with the names, especially like Sump? Where did that come from? Um, most of the names are plays on you know, similar words. So Sumpf is actually swamp and he lives in the sort of swampy under shady of the pond. So we took the name Sumpf 
as sure. just like a slight variation. And Gladys Honeysuckle, we didn't want to call her Gladys Hummingbird, so it's Honeysuckle. So just like little things like that, we're just tweaking them a tiny bit. How did you decide, did you each take turns naming them? Did you just say, here's a good name? How did, how did that naming bit come apart as you were working as a team? I'm trying to remember. I think Howard, <laughs> Howard Chitters was the first one that I remember naming. I think and so, yeah. We, well, we had the, um, a physical, the finger puppets that we named. Um, and so we knew what Howard, Howard looked like, and I thought he looked like a Howard. And <laughs> Jocelyn agreed. <laughs> okay, the finger puppets? Oh, yeah, backtracking. Um, this is, <laughs> so Jocelyn and I were both uh, booksellers at Boswell back in the day. And um, one kind of slow Tuesday night, we were uh, asked by our boss, Daniel, to price a bunch of finger puppets for the children's department. And being us, we were playing with the finger puppets while we priced them. And we decided to give them all names and occupations. You know, as, as you do. <laughs> that and I yeah for some reason Howard Chitters was the first one and he was a mouse a field mouse and we decided that he looked like an accountant so he became one <laughs> yep and I think there was a there was a sheep there was a bear there was a fox um there, there were a raven. few others yeah a the raven, raven. So, uh, you know, some of them were just, were lucky that that was what the finger puppets were. And then <laughs> several of the other characters we, we built out as, as the story expanded. You still have those finger puppets? Um, they're still available for purchase, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't know if they're in the store and I don't think I have any of them. I don't right have now. any. Yeah, I, just, I have them in my heart. <laughs> So how long, I was going to ask you how long this story was knocking around in your minds and like, how did you know you were going to start writing crime fiction together and these, you know, this cozy mystery when you were playing with the finger puppets, had you already talked about this? Um, no, the finger puppets came first, okay. I, I think, and it was the naming of the characters and sort of just goofing around at the, at the desk that night that this idea sort of popped up. So it was started with that and we both write just because, and um, it was, I think it must've been fall because we had decided, oh, NaNoWriMo is coming up. So why don't we just try to write this story for NaNoWriMo? Which um, if you're not familiar with that um, is National Novel Writing Month where it's a, like a worldwide contest in during the month of November, you try to write a 50,000 word novel. And <laughs> it's very fun. If you haven't done it before, you should totally try it. <laughs> so did you start in November? And how long did it take you to write Katie Hallow? Very well, we got a really bad first draft in the end of the month. <laughs> wow. Yeah, we, we started November 1st, uh, as is tradition, and uh, we traded off days. So I can't remember who wrote the first day, but um, you know, one person wrote on odd days, the other person wrote on even days, and then we just emailed the file back and forth at the end of the day. So do you feel like you, are there places where you complement each other or compete with each other in certain areas? Like is someone really good at character traits or plots or I don't know, scene or something? Or is it really, like I, I would never have known that two people would have written this book, all these books. It's so seamless. You seem like the same well, person. <laughs> it's my belief, and I don't know how Jocelyn feels about this, but it's my belief that we are way cleverer together. Um, we tend to bounce ideas off of one another, usually in coffee shops when we're, people can hear us when we're talking about murder. But <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think, I don't know. That's my view is that it, we are cleverer together. <laughs> Yeah, there's, if I read like a line from the book, I cannot remember if I wrote it or if Sharon wrote it. And to me, that's a good sign that it does feel like a cohesive voice and as if one person had written it. Um, I think what we do is bounce ideas off each other and then just sort of see how they develop. And 
if Sharon's rereading something that I've written, she might add a little something. If I'm reading something she's written, I might add a little something. And it just sort of grows in the course of, of several drafts and a lot of revisions. Do you ever get stuck? And if so, like, how do you keep the momentum going? Or do you feel like because you have someone else counting on you, does that help you keep writing, do you think? I think so. I, well, so NaNoWriMo, because it has this structure of you're writing 1,667 words a day uh, in order to hit the magic 50,000, um, you have a goal and it's broken up into these very discrete parts. So that is one motivator that you just like, oh, I just got to get to this magic number by the end of the day. It doesn't have to be good. It just has to be done. And then you can mail it off to the you know your your partner, and I think that also helps keep the momentum going. Um, I won't say there weren't a few days where it was like I just I couldn't today, you know, something yeah. happened at work or whatever, and we didn't quite get our our numbers in. But you make it up later on. So <laughs> yeah, it's a wonderful impetus for jump starting your writing. If you have always wanted to write a novel and you don't know how to do it, it's a really great way to start. There's lots of other people doing it. There's professional writers that give pep talks and it's just a really great program. Yeah, it's a nice community and it just, it helps you feel less alone, which is a common <laughs> issue for writers <laughs> that we feel very, very alone. <laughs> yeah, talk about that. How do you, how do you get out of that funk of feeling alone? Do you have a community that you, or do you just have each other? Do you guys have separate communities that you join and try and, you know, Keep the momentum going that way. Well, we do have each other for the writing, but um, I think we both, well, I, we've always been in a book field, at least, you know, recently we were booksellers. Now I'm a librarian. Jocelyn is also a librarian, but she's a freelance writer as well. And so we have people around us that are interested in books, interested in what we're doing. And uh, that helps a lot. Yeah. Um... Yeah, so I mean, it definitely helps to have a, a partner in writing, um, but us, I'm, I also write romance, and so I have a sort of romance writer community. Um, recently, we've been getting a little bit more into the mystery writer community, so it's, there's always groups of writers who just really want to talk about writing or how hard writing is, and we can all sympathize, and it sort of just helps you get over that hump and, and just keep working. So there's, there's a lot of really good groups, whether they're, well, Back in the day, you'd meet in person at the bookstore, but now it's you know really moved online, and there's shared Zoom calls. If you just like want to log in and have someone else there while you're writing, you don't even talk. It's just sort of like post your word count at the end of a half hour. So there's a lot of different little tools to to help keep you motivated. So everyone asked this question. I'm sure. I'm sorry. I have to bring it up, but the pandemic. So like. Do you, can you talk about any changes that happened sort of during these last couple of years? Did anything become, I don't know, either more clear to you about your writing style or living? Were you in a house with someone else, for example? Some of us are now in houses with their spouses. <laughs> and it wasn't until the pandemic that, you know, it really, really became apparent how much I can't talk to my writer husband in the morning because he's 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 in his head writing already and I want to talk about what we're going to do later in the day or dinner or, you know making a pot of rice or something no 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 I can't do any of that so I'm just wondering if you guys have had any challenges during the pandemic in your own households um well for me my husband is also a writer but he's also a pharmacist and I am a librarian, so both of us have public facing jobs that we could not do from home. <laughs> so there wasn't a huge uh, difference in the way we do things um, because we still had to go to work every day in spite of the pandemic. But Jocelyn works from home, so I'm guessing her her experience was a little different. Yeah, I in one in one sense it was not different, which is that I was already working at home before the pandemic. So my daily routine really didn't change at all. I, you know, got up and made my coffee or tea, and then I sat down at the table and 
did whatever I did. Um, the difference is that my um, husband is, um, n was working not in our house and then he was working in our house. So that did require some adjustment because um, there's a certain aloneness like solitude that I really need to write well. And it took me a while to sort of get used to the idea of there's being, there's someone else in the house. And so we had to work out a routine where either I was in the upstairs office and then he was downstairs or I was downstairs and he was upstairs and we just sort of figured it out. Um, but yeah, it, it's definitely, um, it was a challenge, I want to say for about six, six months. Um, and I think part of that too, is just like, it was a, that sort of beginning of the pandemic was just such a weird, stressful time for everybody that I don't think it was so much the fact that I had an extra person in my house. It was just that nobody knew what was happening in the world. And that is enough to uh, reduce anyone's word count. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Um, I know this isn't a real thing, but I, as I'm reading your books and, uh, and thinking about all the woodland creatures and thinking about research that um, you could be doing, the pandemic wouldn't have uh, messed with that because you can still go out into the woods and check out all the animals and everything. Um, but let's talk about the woodland creature thing for a minute. So I, one of the things that, well, one of the reasons that um, I picked up your book to begin with is because my mother, who's going to be 99 next week, loves books with animals as characters. And I was always looking for those. So several years ago when your book came out, Daniel said, you have to read this one. And I know you know Sharon and she works here or she did work here or something. I can't remember. But um, and so I, grabbed, I think I thought I forced it on you. <laughs> oh, you might have forced it on me. I thought I did. I don't know. <laughs> he forced the other ones on me. <laughs> you did force it on me. And I read it before I gave it to my mom and cause you know, that's what you do. And she loved it. And as I was reading it, I picked it up and I thought a murder mystery with woodland creatures. Well, it must be like a young adult or a children's, not children's, but like a young adult book, right? You don't think of woodland creatures as an adult cozy mystery. I think of cozy mysteries happening in, you know, bakeries and I don't know home renovation and they stumble across a body or whatever. Um, so anyway, I'm curious about sort of your, this is a weird question, your history with woodland creatures. So like, did either of you grow out or grow up hanging out in the woods or hiking or living in the country? Did it really just come from the puppets? I think it came from the puppets. <laughs> uh, see, my question just that was a failure of a question. Come on. No, no, no. I, I, this, this, is a, this is a part where I, we do have a slightly different experience because I, my parents took me camping a lot when I was young and I tromped around the woods a lot uh, growing up because we lived on a lake. And a, a, it was Moose Lake in Wisconsin, by the way. Um, so <laughs> so I, I lived there for years and years and it was a fairly rural slash expert sort of environment so there was a lot of woods there was a lot of just open area and so I would tromp around a lot on my own and it's Wisconsin so you encounter wildlife so it's like yeah they just startle some deer or you know a badger comes and tries to kill you so it was you know kind of kind of that but I, I do really love the outdoors and I think that that was an easy thing to incorporate into the story because I do spend a lot of time outside yeah that's great um, all right, I'm going to change tax. So you guys both being former booksellers, and I think of you guys as having this great sort of behind the scenes perspective, working at an indie bookshop, you really know what happens as book gets published and, you know, all of that stuff. But there's this whole other level of the behind the scenes that happens before a book even gets to the bookstore. And you were previously self-published or indie published. And it just recently, like Daniel said, I think he said, it got picked up by Vintage Crime, which is a Penguin Random House imprint. Awesome, that's so great. So like, what's the story behind that? Behind that? How did that happen? And had, and do you feel like you've learned a lot more about what goes on before the book gets to the bookstore? Absolutely. <laughs> Um, I guess what happened was that um, 
um, our good friend who is a publishing rep for Random House uh, asked if he could take three after we finished the third book, uh, asked if he could show them to his bosses. And we were like, oh, sure, go for it. Nothing's going to happen. But go, you know, please. And, <laughs> and he was kind enough to do that. And lo and behold, they liked him. And yeah, it took a little while. And he said, oh, you're going to get an email. Don't freak out. But you're going to get an email. And we got an email. <laughs> and they, yeah, so they made us an offer for all three books with, as Jocelyn says, real numbers at the bottom. <laughs> And that was uh, like a year, that was in December of 2020. Yeah, so yep. it's been a process ever since that we as booksellers had, I at least I didn't have any idea of what goes on and just the sheer amount of work that a publishing team can, does to get a book out into the world. So um, do you feel like, tell us something that you learned that you didn't expect um, from the publishing world? Um, it, was, it was an interesting experience um, going from indie to sort of the big five, uh, because that's about as dramatic a difference as you can possibly get in publishing. Um, we, we did self, I self-published my romances. So it, it was a very easy step for me to offer to self-publish the mysteries once we started writing them. So we had our little system down. It was, you know, very much a small operator thing. Uh, we have worked with freelance cover designers and freelance editors and freelance proofers. So we had a little team going, but when you move from that to a big five publisher and they have a capital T team, <laughs> so they are, looking at everything and there's multiple sets of eyes and they have, you know, sort of the best artists that you can, you know, employ and, and all of that to, to work on everything. It was really pretty marvelous to see all the moving parts and how it was working together. And all of these people just were like, oh, my job is to pay attention to this one little section of the publishing process. And they're very good at it. So, you know, it's just like this very impressive assembly line from agreeing to do it to this finished product. Um, and I think that they were excited because they bought all three at the same time, which allowed them to sort of work on them as a single project almost. So we knew that, you know, the covers were all gonna have a certain look and they were gonna match and have the same color tones and all of that, which is a really wonderful luxury um, that you don't always get when you're publishing because you don't always know, know what's coming next. Um, but we were able to get a little jump on that. And if you haven't seen it, this is not the UK version, but the US version, and they're beautiful. They're just beautiful. They did a good <laughs> job. Um, I was um, very impressed with the enthusiasm of our team. It was really uh, a great to see how excited they all were. They had all read the books and they liked them. And we were, I thought that was very gratifying that they weren't just like, oh, this is something else that we have to do with these, you know, librarians that wrote this book. <laughs> they were honestly, they seemed very enthusiastic and it was, it was really nice. Yeah, it's incredible to see the passion that comes out of the people that are working for, for you in a situation like that. Um, where did Juno Black come from? Tell us that story. Yeah. Sure. Um, so as, as booksellers and librarians, we have a deep sympathy for anyone shelving a book. And when you have multiple authors on, a, on a, a single title, there's always a question of what name do you shelve it under? So we didn't want to use both our names. <laughs> um, so we, we wanted to come up with a pen name that would be sort of equally you know, reflective of both of our, you know, experiences and, and kind of honor where we were coming from. So Juno comes from Solomon Juno, who is one of the original settlers of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which is where Boswell Books is, of course. And um, Black is a reference to Harriet W. Schwartz bookshops, which both Sharon and I had worked at, although not together, um, which was the predecessor to Boswell. So Juno Black together became the name. 
That's great. That's great. I didn't know that. Um, is there, okay, so what do you think is the hardest part of this whole process of writing a series, of working in a team, of indie publishing, going to um, being published by this, you know, by, by vintage, um, sitting down in the chair every day, each give me, each of you give me one of the, like, the biggest struggle that you have with the writing life. Oh, I think actually the writing part is way more fun. Um, what is difficult for me is the constant self-promotion that it seems to be expected. Um, I'm so used, I'm used to being a bystander on social media and cheerleading other people's books and their lives. And I'm just like, oh my God, how many times do we have to tell people about this? Because it's expected, but it's, it's also, there are so many books out there and so many books are coming out every 15 seconds that it's really, <laughs> how do you distinguish yourself amongst all those books? So that, that is a new thing for me. And it's, it's, yeah, that is, that is difficult. How do you feel about social media? Jocelyn, you can answer in a second. I just have a follow up. <laughs> <laughs> I like it for connecting with people that I'm never going to run to and run into in middle life, in real life. Like seeing what Roxanne Gay is doing is exciting for me. If she's making grilled cheese and tomato soup online, which she's doing, and you can watch her do it. Um, I like that a lot. And I also like connecting with my friends that are in other states that I don't see on a regular basis. Now, my friends in the same city that I don't see because of the pandemic. So I like that aspect of it, but yeah, there are things that I don't like. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the, the having to constantly look at me, look at me, because this is what I'm doing and then not paying attention to what anyone else is doing. I, I see that a lot in, <laughs> on Twitter and things like that. Yeah. Turn, Jocelyn. Jocelyn, give us a challenge and how you feel about social media. Um, well, as, as for the challenge, I, I really do have to agree with Sharon. I, I love writing. I love editing. So drafting is somewhat difficult. Editing is a pleasure for me. Um, and promotion is hell. Um, I don't, self-promotion feels very un-Midwestern. So it's not really um, something I feel comfortable doing because as I think a lot of people who are listening right now can probably relate to, um, it doesn't feel very natural to constantly talk about yourself. It's impolite. So now we are in this, this situation and, and even with my romance novels, it's the same kind of thing where it's like, I have this thing, go buy it. And that's not <laughs> me. <laughs> um, so that, that is definitely a challenge uh, that I need to overcome every single time I need to, you know, oh, I have to schedule more posts on Twitter to talk about me. Um, it's much more fun to, again, like see Roxanne Gay make grilled cheese sandwiches because that I can identify with that in my soul. <laughs> but also as booksellers, you guys promoted everyone else's books and were very passionate about it. And Sharon- and That's and easy said, because it's somebody no. else. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's fair. <laughs> oh, what were you, what did you say, Margaret, after? Well, no, I was just going to say for, you did a great job promoting yourself in person. Oh, in the bookstore, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but well, but. You, you, you were easy because I, you were nice and you were, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And oh. the, yeah, being still being a bookseller is a different persona than just me because I'm representing the bookstore. So I can say hey, there's this great book here, but if you don't like that, I have 75 others that I can talk to you about. I think that's still a, a separation between me and yeah, just me going, hey, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I'd like to order this coffee. And did you know that I have a book coming out? You know, people don't care. <laughs> they don't and care. Please buy all three. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm gonna, there's some questions piling up. So I'm gonna go to one here. Um, Megan asks, oh, this is awesome. My most pressing question, if you each were to be turned into a very human animal, what animal would it be? Oh God. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> um, I'm going to, I'm going to go with a lynx because I like cats. Uh, 
in my heart, I like winter. I don't like it actually, but in my head, I, I, I like winter. So like, I feel like I'd be at home there. And also they are very secretive and quiet like me. So I just, you know, be, feel like that would be good. Wow, she has clearly thought about this and I have not. <laughs> we can come back to you, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, or I would just say, I, you know, I like, um, I like the idea of, of a fox. I like, the, I identify with Vera quite a bit because she, first of all, she's a know-it-all, which I am. And she also wants to know everything that she doesn't know. So yeah, I, I, get, I, think, I think a fox. <laughs> I like Vera too. Um, all your characters, they're just so wonderful. Um, okay, uh, Mark asks, if you write a fourth book, are you writing a fourth book? Maybe. <laughs> Boy. <laughs> I hope my mom's still alive when it comes out. So too. No pressure, Margaret, no pressure. <laughs> no pressure, but you know, time's ticking. Um, okay, if you write a fourth book, would you consider including a feline character? Perhaps an old college roommate of Vera's, now a successful MD and entrepreneur. <laughs> that is so you might know this person. specific, and I think I know who that Mark person is. <laughs> <laughs> um, a feline character would be domestic, and that might be difficult, but yeah, we, we know that Vera has a backstory. At some point, we are going to tell her about, talk about her past in the big city before she moved to Shady Hollow, but not sure when that's going to happen, but thank you for your suggestion, sir. <laughs> and actually just, we do have a wildcat character, the, um, the, the police officer in, in High Bank, which is a town um, oh, yeah. close to Shady Hollow. Uh, she, she's the law in that town. So we like her. It, it, technically we do have a feline character. <laughs> Mark. <laughs> Mark. If that is indeed your um. real name. <laughs> Uh, Stacy asks, were there any characters you had to kill off as writers that you were sad about? Um, you mean, do we regret murdering our victims? I think it's really the question here. <laughs> um, not really. Uh, you know, I think, <laughs> um, casual. you weren't that attached. <laughs> Well, I the first we, book. We <laughs> no, yeah, Otto, no spoilers. Uh, you know, Otto started out dead. So we didn't really have a chance to um, get too attached to him. Um, and I think just as the stories sort of, we sort of workshopped them and, and kind of decided on, you know, what, like, who's the victim? What's the plot? What's the, the big secret that caused the murder? Um, the victims were sort of mapped out far enough in advance that we were able to um, uh, just, you know, get on with the, the bloody business of murder and, and not worry too much about them as, as, as people. <laughs> the murder. Cold, cold, cold. What? When, we're, when we were talking the other day, oh, what did you say? This was so funny. You, one of you said you had a background in murder. And I was like, what? <laughs> Was that oh, was that was that we both have. Um, we were grow. We grew up with similar backgrounds. Uh, my parents were big mystery readers. My mom, especially, if there wasn't a body by like page two, she was not having it. Um, and Agatha Christie and Sherlock Holmes were big in our house, so I grew up reading those. And Jocelyn apparently had the same parents, <laughs> in spite of being younger. And yep. in eight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah all, all all the mystery show all the murder shows on tv you know murder she wrote matlock perry mason if there wasn't a murder you know perry my parents mason were not interested <laughs> uh same for books so they just got out every kind of detective novel from the library and because i was a reader i read their books as well as mine so it mm -hmm. just same, it yeah. kind of was how we grew up you know murderous <laughs> that's great okay so this is a great segue to um <laughs> to this little thing I want to do with you guys. Um, in your bio, it says, though they are two separate people, if you ask either of them a question about their childhood, you are likely to get the same answer. We're going to have a little fun with this. So I'm going to throw out a topic and I want you each to answer. Um, uh, favorite 
non-alcoholic beverage? Tea. Coffee. <laughs> pretty close but not exactly <laughs> not exactly <laughs> okay how about do you guys have a favorite snack uh, does cheese a snack or is that a category of of nutritional food i think that's a snack yeah then we're gonna have the to cheese, the cheese. <laughs> it's part of the one of the things i really love about wisconsin i'm not a native wisconsinite but and i don't i'm sorry to say follow football but i feel really welcome here because of the cheese because <laughs> of the cheese. <laughs> um, tell us each a favorite movie from like when you were a kid. One of the four food groups, someone says, cheese. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, favorite movie. Oh, that's uh, hard to narrow down. Um, I'm going to, like childhood movie. I'm, I'm going to go with Lady and the Tramp because I watched it a lot. Um, yeah, and I can see... I'm picturing TV shows because I was a big Nancy Drew person. Oh, yeah. When I was a little older, I was obsessed with, you know, when they started making the the TV show. So I'm, I'm going to have to go with that. Mm -hmm. Nancy Drew. <laughs> Got a TV show to throw in there, Jocelyn? Um, oh, TV show. Law and Order. <laughs> like the original, <laughs> the OG Law and Order. Loved it. <laughs> oh, and Buffy. <laughs> oh, always Buffy. Yeah, Buffy. definitely. <laughs> were there sitcoms when you were, uh, you know, when you first started watching sitcoms that you liked when you were young? When well, I was young, my, my taste hadn't fully separated from my parents, I think. So they were watching uh, Murphy Brown. So I watched Murphy Brown and Brown. stuff like that. So there was always like the Nickelodeon, like Nick at Night stuff. I'd watch that on my own, but <laughs> that, was, that was more of a rebellion. Yeah, I was too old for that, the Nickelodeon. I watched Murphy Brown by myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. Okay, last one. <laughs> Pie or cake? Pie. Pie. All right. Step, okay. I, I, there's a cheesecake clause in that. Mm, mm, mm -hmm. Cheesecake is kind of, it's so dense, it's like pie. Yeah, okay. It's, yeah. it's, it's yeah. just called cake <laughs> in the name, but it's, oh, it's yeah. more like pie. Um, okay, back, back to our regularly scheduled questions. Um, Donna asks, how's your work process the same or different than the first time with alternate days of 1600 pages? Great question. Well, um, Jocelyn is uh, a plotter, what is called a plotter, and I am a pantser, which means I just kind of like, la la la, go along and let's see what happens. But um, I have come around a little bit to her way of thinking in that, and and having an outline makes it so much easier. It makes it, <laughs> I don't like the idea of an outline or writing an outline, but having it is very, very helpful. So that we have yeah. learned over yeah. the course of three books. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I also don't love an outline. Um, I have come to understand its necessity, but I do not love it. Um, what we do with our our process specifically for the Shady Hollow books is something that's closer to um, what's called story beats. So it's a little bit looser than an outline and um, it works well for our particular pattern uh, because what we do is you'll write the scene that's sort of laid out there for you and then you can specify a couple of ideas afterward like, oh, I think that what's gonna happen is you know, after she discovers this clue in this scene, it's gonna mean that she has to go over to this other location and talk to this character. So you kind of have a couple of ideas for the next scene. And then because we are switching off each day, we can kind of just keep that story beat a couple of points ahead of where we're actually writing. And then that sort of keeps us on track for yeah, it gives you getting somewhere to, the to end. go. Yeah. yeah. It gives you somewhere to go when you log in and it's your turn to write and you're just Yeah, like, it's not a blank page. <laughs> <laughs> so I wonder if an author writing by himself, for example, could just pretend he was two people. <laughs> just email himself, you know, every day in these little prompts. Just okay. just to use a hypothetical example. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Aaron Bo Aaron Boyd says, hi, Aaron says, I could see these stories cross over into other mediums, like Netflix, board games. Would you be open to this? 
uh, yes, Aaron. Yes, we I would. Mean, are you all <laughs> are you still here? <laughs> um, no, I, 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 that has been mentioned several times by uh, friends of mine with it. They're like, oh, when is it going to be a TV show? I was like, well, when someone options it. Yeah. Um, but, Barack and um, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> no, we would My absolutely love dream. to see it. Yeah. <laughs> That's you great. know, graphic novel, uh, you know, or, you know, any kind of format, because I think it does sort of lend itself to that. It's a very, um, I don't want to say cinematic, because that sounds pretentious, but like you can envision uh, the, the setting and the scenes and the pie, um, which I think would and be, coffee. and the coffee. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I would totally watch everyone. Um, okay, the students at Parkview School, awesome. Thank you for being here. Want yeah. to know if you would ever consider an insect character? Ooh. <laughs> I now have metaphysical questions about my own world. <laughs> I thought it was weird to have like the moose and the raven hang out or, you know, I was having trouble with the proportions for a little while, but well, I had to suspend yeah. belief. In this case, there's also a problem, I think, with the food chain, although... Um, our, our characters are all vegetarians, mm -hmm. um, but I don't know. Yeah, that would, we'd have to think about the whole insect thing, but excellent question. Yeah, <laughs> excellent question. perhaps if it was a, a very remarkable insect, you know, we'll have to, we'll have to see what the next story brings. <laughs> um, Carolyn wants to know, would you recommend your books for teenage reading? Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. If you're teenage, if you're a teenager who enjoys murder, um, then absolutely. So, <laughs> you know, I think we were reading we, Agatha Christie when we were teenagers. And yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I'm supposed to do this, but I'm going to anyway. There's a comment in the chat. Mark says the thing about the insects that would increase the population of Shady Hollow into the hundreds of millions. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be a metropolis. <laughs> <laughs> um, is it true these are being published in Japan? It is true. Um, we <laughs> sold the rights to the Japanese translation. Um, we don't have any specific dates yet, but it will be translated into Japanese. Um, and we are very excited for that because I can only imagine the covers are going to be adorable. Oh, yeah. <laughs> would have to be. That's exciting. Are there any other, um, do you have any other foreign uh, not not at the moment, but we are we are hopeful that it will soon be around the world in all languages. Yes. <laughs> because woodland creature animal language is universal. That's right. Um, Dawn says, "I love when we get more of the backstory about your characters, especially their lives pre Shady Hollow." You mentioned Vera. Which other characters' histories do you have ideas about expanding on? Um, I have some ideas for Lenore. And, okay. uh, yeah, and uh, I think we, we did delve a little bit into Joe's backstory um, in Cold Clay. And I think that if we um, sort of get into some more of the characters, uh, I don't wanna, I don't wanna spoil anything, but you know. Yeah, but I, I think it would be fun to do um, Orville's background. Like, absolutely. <laughs> like up in the police academy, like, you know, that could be fun. Mm-hmm. Yep. And uh, don't don't you wonder how B.W. Stone got to be at the head of the newspaper? Like there's there's so many questions we can get into. <laughs> oh, I do. <laughs> um, what are you what are you guys reading now? And can you recommend some books for us? Oh. <laughs> well, I am currently obsessed with um, Diana Gabaldon's book. Um, from the Outlander series. So I have always loved those books. And the latest one is 900 pages and I can't do anything else until I finish it. So, <laughs> but those have a, those are about time travel if you haven't read them and they're so good and romantic and just engrossing. And did you watch the series? I have to say, I tried to watch the series, but the Jamie and Claire in my head are different than the ones on the screen. I think they did a nice job with the show, but it doesn't captivate me like the books do. Yeah. Curious. Jocelyn? Um, I am currently in a um, light mystery reading phase, um, which 
isn't always the case, but it's definitely in the case when it's like a cold winter month and a six months period. Um, I am reading um, The Will Darling Adventures by KJ Charles right now. Um, and they are set um, post um, World War One in Britain. And it's like kind of pulpy, kind of mystery, kind of romance. And they are incredibly fun to read. So I am always recommending KJ Charles to people. Great, thank you. Um... I was um, reading an interview with you on uh, Rochelle's blog. Maybe Daniel can get on it and put a link in there to it. I don't know. Um, <laughs> and you talked about um, how you developed the setting and you talked about how it grew very organically. And I don't wanna just read what she wrote, but you need to go read what she wrote. But talk about that a little bit for people who haven't, um, gone over to her blog to read about that, how it just grew so organically as you wrote the first draft. Do you remember? Um, you yeah, I, I think, yeah, for us, it, I know it's, it seems like such a, a cop out to say it organically because that just, you know, kind of doesn't give us, give you a, a process, but we really did sort of start with these characters and their occupations. And that inspired some of the setting right away because if Vera is a reporter, she needs to have a newspaper to report for. And that means we have a newspaper office and that means you have a boss and you have coworkers. So it kind of, it's imagine if you're like in a video game exploring a setting, it sort of just pops out in front of you as you keep moving forward um, and the world is built as, as you're progressing through it. So if you work at a newspaper office, you like coffee. That means there's gotta be a coffee shop really close by. And if there is a coffee shop, there's going to be a coffee shop owner. So it's, it's just kind of, what do we need? How, what's, what is in every sort of ideal small town? Um, so, you know, a bookstore, a library, a coffee shop, all of these, these things that you want to go to. And, you know, I think for us, part of it is just like, let's have fun in a town. And where would we go if we had a magical, you know, wonderful town that we could just invent? Um, which is why we have a place like the Bamboo Patch, which is just like, I want to eat there. That's why we wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff like that. So <laughs> I love the quirkiness of the village. Um, and it seems like typically in um, like mysteries and thrillers, I don't know if this happens to all writers who write mysteries and thrillers, that they really, re they, you're creating their own town so often you know, it's already set in a place that already exists. So you take what's already there. Um, but it seems like you guys have the best of both worlds of creating your own town, creating your own village, creating the quirkiness of the characters and sort of going off the standard playbook of mystery writing. So um, I think that's just what makes it so great. And so uniquely, it's just so unique. Just awesome. You guys did a great job. Um, any more questions? How are we doing on time, Daniel? I know it's 726. I wasn't you, told. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is completely up to you. I mean, you can wrap up. I can try to put up the famous painting of Howard Chitters. Ooh, yes. Oh, uh, let's yes, see if Aaron I can do this <laughs> screen share. Uh, That's worth seeing. That's worth seeing. Did it show up? Yeah. Yes. 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 So. Howard. <laughs> by by the great Aaron did Boyd. Did Aaron do this? <laughs> he did. Isn't it beautiful? Yep. It's so beautiful. Oh, Aaron, you are so talented. Look at this. Are you going to do all of it? Somehow he knew what was in our head. <laughs> he did. It was absolutely perfectly Howard right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. He needs to do all the characters. And... Thank you, Dan. Well, so actually, this isn't going to be as good as a screen share because I just have it printed out on a card that I found in the book copy that I had. Oh, um, yeah. Aaron also did an illustration um, for the for the very first um, indie publication several years ago, and you can kind of see in there. I'm sorry, but there's some glare. It is um, Vera searching for clues, and the, all of the other characters are kind of in the margins. And if you look closely, there is a feline character. That's on right. The, 
Well, uh, it's on the right hand side toward the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> so, the, mo the moral of the story is get to know really good artists and make them do stuff for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Any other questions? Do you guys have any parting words, things you'd like to say? Thank you so much to Boswell for starting our career. No, I don't know. <laughs> well, <laughs> honestly, yeah. thank you very much to Boswell for starting, for starting our, career. our career. And, and thank you well, to Daniel, Daniel, Daniel for is hand our, selling. Daniel is our cheerleader, yes. I have no writing talent, though I did, until you got pop, you got this book out, we did do a NaNoWriMo event every year, if you'll remember. That's I, right. <laughs> I also want to mention one other weird thing, which was when I said to you, it's like, when you have three books, you can do what Alexander McCall Smith did, because they, it wasn't until the, th after the third book, the Penguin oh, Random House oh, picked up, and, and, and now you're talking to Alexander McCall Smith file, um, which I, I totally forgot that you said that. <laughs> I remember the three book part, because I'm, <laughs> was very key but I forgot about for you. Yeah because it was published by a university press I think in Scotland and our Columbia University press rep who published the driest books ever was running around to every store in the Midwest saying you've got to bring this in you've got to bring this in and um and uh yeah it was after the third book that they, they wow. and, I, and I, I I didn't really think it was going to happen quite so close to that, but <laughs> Anyway, yeah. you, everybody's got to see him tomorrow. So this was a really great event. He won't okay, wait, be quite wait, as good. Wait. I have oh, one, there's one more question. Oh, who is the wolf based on? Absolutely no real characters or people or authors. No, Absolutely hard. not. Never Just ever. Sort of a composite. <laughs> composite. <laughs> let's let's say let's say that he is an amalgamation of the worst traits that absolutely no visiting authors to Boswell or Schwartz or any other bookstores ever would have evidenced at all because but only so much fun to write too. so much fun to write <laughs> yeah is the worst <laughs> I have one more thing to add which is the Juno Black thing you know I never I was like of course I know Schwartz is Black because of um, does everyone remember Lauren Fox's first novel takes place partly at the Harry W. Schwartz in Shorewood, and it was oh, called Black's Bookshop. That's right. Oh, I so oh that's I funny. <laughs> Good woman, Lauren Fox. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, thank you both, and congratulations. Um, may right, this, I, uh, I, boy, I really want book four, so I hope, I'm already, I'm like, just start writing now. But um, <laughs> yeah. and thank you, um, Margaret. Um, I put a link yeah. in. Thank you, Margaret. You can watch, uh, listen to more um, episodes in her podcast and look at all her, um, all kinds of wonderful things there. The Rochelle Mal Malanders um, uh, uh -huh. interview as well. Click on those links and they will open in another page. So when this goes away, they will still be here. This event is um, recorded. Please share it with other people. You'll get a copy of it. Um, later in the week. Thank you both so much. On to greater and greater things. <laughs>